Hey friends, welcome back. Here we're going to begin Katsung Chapter 6, which is the Introduction to Autonomic Pharmacology. So we're going to start off by comparing the somatic nervous system to the autonomic nervous system. Here we see the somatic nervous system. The first point I want to make is this is a one neuron pathway. The cell body of this neuron is in the spinal cord. It leaves and it innervates skeletal muscle and this is under voluntary control and the neurotransmitter that it is using is acetylcholine. And you might remember that this skeletal muscle at the neuromuscular junction has a nicotinic receptor and it's a special type of nicotinic receptor. It's the muscular version so we denote that with a little m. Now the way binding this receptor causes an effect is that this nicotinic receptor is a sodium and potassium gated ion channel and that is what happens when the acetylcholine binds. It allows the flow of potassium and sodium through that channel. Now let's differentiate this from the autonomic nervous system. Instead of being one neuron, the autonomic nervous system is two neurons. The first neuron we call the preganglionic, the second neuron we call the postganglionic. This preganglionic neuron, its cell body is in the CNS. And remember here that the most basic definition of the CNS is just the brain plus the spinal cord. And at this, this neuron here is releasing acetylcholine at the ganglia. The ganglia is where the cell body of the postganglionic neuron resides. And so here we also see a nicotinic receptor but this receptor is a little bit different than the one we saw at the skeletal muscle. It's for neural tissue, it's from, uh, it has a neural crest derivative. We denote this nicotinic receptor with a little n. Fortunately, this is using the same ligand gated ion channel. It is a sodium and potassium ion channel. So the reason this is important is one, it's basic physiology, but two, if they said a new drug was developed which affects sodium and potassium ion channels, or a new drug was developed that affects nicotinic receptors, where might this drug affect the body? You would say, well, one, it's doing it at the skeletal muscle, and two, it's at the autonomic ganglia. Now, the postganglionic neuron, there are two types. There's a sympathetic and a parasympathetic. If it's a sympathetic postganglionic neuron, it releases norepinephrine, and this is going to bind to one of two receptors. One of them we call the alpha receptor, the other we call a beta receptor. And there's a alpha 1 and an alpha 2, and there's a beta 1 and a beta 2. If it's a parasympathetic neuron, it's going to release acetylcholine. And if the receptor that this binds to, this is a muscarinic receptor. And there's three important muscarinic receptors, M1, M2, and M3. Now here, the way that this causes an effect is through G-protein coupled receptors. And you should have learned about these when you talked about your signal transduction. And so there's three types. There is GS, which increases the levels of cyclic AMP. There is GI, which decreases the levels of cyclic AMP. And there is GQ, which uses you know, inositol triphosphate or diacylglycerol, DAG, to cause an effect. So what I've done here is I've essentially listed out the, uh, I've kind of reviewed some of this basic information for you and I've written them here. I've gone over the neurotransmitters, we've gone over the receptors, and we've gone over the cell signaling mechanism. I want to draw your attention here to the norepinephrine. As a basic rule of thumb, you should note that the postganglionic sympathetic neuron uses norepinephrine. But there are three exceptions to this rule, and each one of those three exceptions is a high-yield topic that has been tested on the boards before. So here is figure 6-1 from your textbook, and it's essentially covering what we did before. We showed here at the bottom, we have this somatic uh, nervous system here. It's using acetylcholine on a nicotinic receptor. This was a one neuron pathway up here. We have the parasympathetic the two-neuron pathway using acetylcholine and this muscarinic receptor. 
And so the first exception to the rule here is um, that the sympathetic nervous system is in control of the sweat glands. But even though this is sympathetic, it is using acetylcholine and it is using a muscarinic receptor. And so this is the first topic here. What we call this is we call this sympathetic cholinergic. And so we see if sympathetic is using acetylcholine with a muscarinic receptor, and we know that parasympathetic uses acetylcholine with a muscarinic receptor, the point here is that all secretions are using acetylcholine with a muscarinic receptor. And so if you ever see something that says dry mouth, one of the first things you should think of is this is acetylcholine with a muscarinic receptor. The second exception to the rule we see here, and this is regarding the innervation of the renal vascular smooth muscle. Here we're using dopamine and it's binding to a D1 receptor. So what's going on here? Well the sympathetic nervous system is relaxing, relaxing this renal vascular smooth muscle using dopamine with this D1 receptor. How is this important? Well, remember that with a sympathetic response, you're going to cause vasoconstriction. It's going to uh, constrict your blood vessels. And so one place we want to make sure that we maintain blood flow to is the kidneys. And so the reason that dopamine works and it's part of the sympathetic nervous system is that dopamine and norepinephrine have overlapping effects. And in fact, dopamine, norepinephrine, and epinephrine are all related. Let's just briefly discuss the high yield points here. So dopamine is actually the precursor to norepinephrine. All we're doing to dopamine is adding a hydroxyl group, and we use an enzyme called dopamine beta hydroxylase to make norepinephrine. And epinephrine is the precursor, I'm sorry, norepinephrine is the precursor to epinephrine. And the only difference between these is that we're adding a methyl group using an enzyme that ends with methyl transferase. So you're going to have to know what dopamine is and how it differs from norepinephrine and epinephrine. And one of these distinctions is that dopamine acts at the renal vascular smooth muscle. The third exception to the rule here is at the adrenal medulla. So add renal on top of the kidneys the medulla here. Note that this is using acetylcholine as a neurotransmitter and it's a nicotinic receptor. This is just like the ganglia that we saw up here. In fact, the adrenal medulla has the same embryologic origin. It's from the neural crest. And so it's acting like a post-ganglionic sympathetic neuron. But instead of releasing norepinephrine at a neurotransmitter, it's releasing epinephrine and norepinephrine into the blood. And this is about a 80-20 mix. So the sympathetic nervous system activates the adrenal medulla, our medulla, and it releases epinephrine and norepinephrine into the blood. What cells are doing this? These are the chromaffin cells. And like we noted, these are uh, activated by acetylcholine. And the final point here is that in terms of the autonomic nervous system, epinephrine is a hormone. It's going into the blood. And so it's going to act where there are neurons because it will just diffuse throughout, but it will also act at places there are not neurons and just receptors. And we call these uninnervated receptors. And a primary example is the beta-2 receptor. This is what differentiates epinephrine from norepinephrine. So let me give you an example. If I was to say that this was a neuron, and here we have some tissue, this neuron releases a neurotransmitter, and there is typically a receptor on the other side. This is an innervated receptor. Let's just say this is norepinephrine. In contrast, if I have epinephrine, let's say in the blood, so this is epi, and this is the blood, that epinephrine is just going to kind of diffuse all throughout the body. And so it can act on receptors that aren't necessarily associated with a neuron. These are the uninnervated receptors that I'm referring to.
and one of these receptors is the beta-2 receptor. And this is what makes epinephrine pretty much different from norepinephrine. And we'll get to that when we talk about uh, the adrenergics, and you'll have that lecture with Dr. Leslie. But kind of keep that in your back pocket. Remember that. So before we go into an example, let's just uh, do a quick little question here. Let's just assume that we blocked acetylcholine release throughout the body with a new drug. What would happen? And I'm going to give you a little high-yield board point here. This blocking acetylcholine release, the drug that does that is Botox. So what might be affected if we blocked acetylcholine release? Well, we think, where is acetylcholine release throughout the body? And it's essentially everything that we've talked about. It's at the skeletal muscle. We saw this at the sweat glands because that is sympathetic using acetylcholine. It's at all of the autonomic ganglia. It's at the postganglionic parasympathetic neurons. And also, it's what activates the adrenal medulla. So all of these could be a potential board question. Which of the following would be affected by blocking acetylcholine throughout the body? So what we're going to do here is a little example. And we're going to use just basic pharmacology and not really get into any drugs yet, but to think of how an understanding of autonomics can really help you problem solve. And so these are tools that you're going to use, or strategies that you're going to use to solve problems as we go through these lectures. So the question here is a patient has bradycardia. Name two possible treatment strategies using autonomic pharmacology. So here we see the heart. And the heart is one of those organs that is dually innervated. It has parasympathetic innervation and it has sympathetic innervation. And hopefully you remember that the sympathetic activation, this increases heart rate and it uses norepinephrine. Let's talk about exactly how this works. So norepinephrine binds to a receptor and that receptor is the beta-1 receptor. And I'm going to put some stars by here because this is an important receptor because it's unique to the heart. And this norepinephrine is acting at the sinoatrial node, and it is activating this beta-1 receptor, which is a G-protein-coupled receptor. In, particular, in particularly, it's a stimulatory type. And as a result here, this increases the level of cyclic AMP, and that would increase the heart rate. So this would be one strategy. Let's think about now what happens when we use when we have parasympathetic activation. So on the parasympathetic side, we have that vagal nerve, and it releases acetylcholine. Instead of binding to a beta-1 receptor, it is binding to a muscarinic receptor. And we're going to put a star by this, because this is also relatively unique for the heart. And instead of it being a stimulatory G protein, it's an inhibitory G protein. And as a result, the levels of cyclic AMP dec de decrease, and this is going to lead to a decrease in heart rate. So one solution is to use sympathetic activation, but the other solution could be just to block this parasympathetic side. Because if we block the parasympathetic side, then the sympathetic side is unopposed. So what I'm saying here is that there are two ways to increase the heart rate. One is through increasing the sympathetic activity at this beta-1 receptor. And one of the drugs we could use was norepinephrine. Here we're referring to essentially using some sort of agonist at that beta-1 receptor. But the other option is to decrease parasympathetic activity using an antagonist. And you might be thinking, well, I thought you said in an earlier lecture that antagonists have zero efficacy. Right? They're just blocking the agonist from working. And that is true. But with an organ that has dual innervation, if we block the parasympathetic side, the other side, the sympathetic side, takes over. So the flip side of this is also going to be true. Let's kind of make some room here. What are two ways to decrease the heart rate? Well. We could either decrease the sympathetic activity using a beta-1 antagonist, or like they refer to clinically, a beta blocker. 
you might know that UCI had a IM volleyball team called the Beta Blockers. And the other option is here we can increase parasympathetic activity using some sort of agonist. So they might ask you a question just kind of using words, but it's more likely they're going to use a graph. The boards love graphs. So you might get a graph that shows the heart rate with time on the x-axis. And it would say, you know, let's call this time t1, let's call this time t equals 2. They say, at time t equals 1, list what drug was used, and at t equals 2, what possible drugs could be used. So here we see, oh, this is an increase in heart rate. So that means that it could be a beta-1 agonist. It could be a muscarinic antagonist. Or conversely, it could be a drug, a new undeveloped drug, that increased the levels of cyclic AMP. So you got to know the second messengers here. On the flip side, we could have a beta-1 antagonist, which decreases the heart rate, a muscarinic agonist, which would decrease the heart rate, or a drug undeveloped or developed that decreases the levels of cyclic AMP. So to recap, the four things you should know is one, graphical interpretation of the effects of these drugs, two, the neurotransmitters, three, the receptors, and four, these second messengers like cyclic AMP that we just talked about.